Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in this last seminar of the Euromarine Seminar Series uh, in Marine Science. Uh, today, we are going to have a video uh, from Professor uh, Mark uh, Costello uh, from the university, from North University. Uh, Professor Costello is an ecologist with a long uh, time interest in biodiversity and biogeography from uh, local to global uh, scales, particularly in marine and freshwater ecosystems uh, and applications in conservation regarding MPAs and aquaculture. Uh, he led the, the establishment uh, of the World Register of Marine Species and Ocean Biodiversity Information System. Uh, he was born in Ireland and he has worked in Britain, Ireland, Canada, and New Zealand. Uh, he has over 100 uh, papers uh, related to uh, MPAs. And uh, today uh, we are going to watch the video because he wasn't avail available to come. And uh, where he is at the moment, there is uh, not a very reliable connection to internet, uh, but he might join us later and uh, take questions from, from you. Uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, uh, write them in the chat. And um, I think uh, that from my side, this is all. I hope to enjoy the talk today. And uh, we will take the questions afterwards. And uh, if he is not able to join, we will send the questions to him by email, and we will get back to you with uh, with his reply. So thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the the talk today. Hello. Thank you for this kind invitation to speak to you. And I'm sorry I can't be there in person. So I'm going to give you a little journey through some of the research I've been doing in the last decade or so um, and make this relevant to climate change and impacts on biodiversity at the end of the talk. So first, I, I'm Irish, but uh, I spent uh, a good few years, 16 years in New Zealand, and one of the nice traditions the Maori have is called a whakapapa. And this is where we introduce ourselves and where we're coming from at the start of a meeting. So I'm from Ireland. I studied in Kildare. I, uh, I, were, I was born in Kildare and I studied in Galway and Cork. And then I had postdocs in Plymouth in England and up in Scotland. And after that, I worked in Trinity College in Dublin, ran a consulting company there for a few years and then moved to Canada for a few years with my family who are Canadian. And um, then we, after, after those years, we have now moved back to Europe where I'm based in Nord University, just inside the Arctic Circle. So in this talk, I'm going to summarize first some of my research, which began a little over 10 years ago on how many species really exist and try to bring some quantitative methods to that. Then I'll talk a bit about how the same databases have been used to look at global marine species patterns um, with latitude, depth, and temperature. And in looking at temperature, we discovered a general pattern, which is uh, I find really intriguing and opens a lot more avenues for further research. I'd also like to thank many of my postgraduates and students, some of whom have directly um, provided some of the results that I'll report here, but many others contributed to helpful discussion and the camaraderie um, in our research group. And also my many authors who've, uh, who are uh, working on the paper that we have recently submitted and is under review on the significance of 20 degrees centigrade. So it's been a great public interest um, about how many species exist, even though many scientists ponder why, why it's such a an interesting question or relevant question. But I think it's because people expect scientists to go out and discover things like atoms and protons and chemicals and molecules and species, of course. But with, not only do we think people know this, we know this from the oldest published works. So according to the Bible, naming species is the mission from God. Moreover, 
in the Quran, it also uh, uh, tells mankind to go out and name species. And some thousand years later, the Sikh Holy Scriptures actually estimated the number of species at about 8,400,000. And if you read around the literature, it's kind of amusing that some scientists came up with exactly the same number, but presumably different methods. And in some of the literature, we come across papers that have been published predicting that there's trillions, millions and billions of species may exist. And you really wonder what these authors are meaning about species, because if this is true, then the fact that about a thousand species are documented to have gone extinct and some people say a million are threatened. Um, well, that's trivial. If there's billions and trillions of species, we don't need to worry. Um, but of course, that's not the case because these authors are not using species in the way that species have been named to date. The databases that I'll refer to here are the World Register of Mean Species, which we established in around 2006 and 2007, and has now grown into the, the primary resource for information on marine species names and some associated information. And a larger global database, the Catalog of Life, includes uh, most of worms, uh, data, um, but also all species from freshwater and terrestrial environments. And for distribution data, I will, I will use the Ocean Biodiversity Information System. So when we name a species, we have quite a lot of information in the name, not only its classification, but we know the authors who named it and the year that they named it. And but there are many species names. So these two species, these two fish look completely different. And indeed, Linnaeus described them as separate species in 1758. But it was later discovered that one is the male and the female, and both Latin names have been widely used. But the problem gets even worse. So the sperm whale, which I think every one of us would recognize and most children would recognize from Moby Dick and other books, um, Linnaeus named it three times, gave it scientific names, and his contemporaries, in the around the same time named it many times as well. So it's actually got 19 scientific names. And overall, marine mammals have got nine na scientific names for every species. And some of them it's even worse. So for example, the humpback whale in the Northwest Atlantic has 84 common names, which isn't perhaps surprising for such a charismatic species, but it's got 46 scientific names. And people have underestimated the importance or the problems that this causes until we started creating databases, because databases need to know what's what and they need to know, you know, the exact spelling of names and so on, or they count them as different names. And how we've we been doing in naming species. This graph um, you can download from the World Register of Marine Species Statistics page, and you can download the data to draw your own graph. And on the left, it shows the cumulative number of marine species over time from Linnaeus in 1750s uh, up to the present. Um, and the solid line is cumulative, but the circles are not cumulative. The circles are the number of species per year. And you can see that we have discovered a lot more species in the last uh, few decades. And in fact, we have never been describing so many marine species as we are now. But of course, the synonyms, which is the yellow dots here, synonyms, the peak of synonyms was about a century ago, but we're still discovering, we're still probably creating new synonyms as well. So we may lose about 40,000 of these 240,000 species due to with the tidying up of names and taxonomic revisions in the future. And this needs to be kept in mind when we're making estimates of how many species exist, because we may already be overestimating it based on the number of names. And if we look at these trends over time, this is terrestrial on the left axis, there's up to 6,000 species per year. Marine on the right axis at this point is around 1,400 species, but now it's over 2,000 species per year. Um, and land is green and uh, the blue is marine, of course. And we can see that the number of species on land has been more or less a similar number described since the last Second World War. And the, you can see the peaks here of, of discoveries about 100 years ago. 1911 was actually the peak of naming of all species. And we see the effects of the two world wars. Um, 
And the lack of recovery of the terrestrial species is curious, but nobody has really discussed it much. But it could be that we have actually discovered most terrestrial species and that this number here is being maintained by the growth in taxonomy globally. And marine species, of course, took off greatly after the Second World War with the, the growth of the building of marine laboratories and research vessels all around the world. But what if we look at the number of authors? And this really shocked us about uh, over a decade ago when we looked at the database and discovered that there's five times more authors now, people describing species, than there were um, in the 1950s. So this is a huge growth in, in the taxonomic community, which hadn't been noticed before. In fact, many people have been saying that taxonomists are going extinct, and you can find papers that say this, but none of them have any data. And we have the data in the databases. We know who the authors are. We know where they work. So the number of authors is also highly correlated with the number of, of publications, and it's been increasing in all continents, not just Asia and South America, but especially there. And the number of authors is probably the best available indicator we have at the moment of effort. And of course, taxonomists are not just people who describe species, but are also people who may do uh, follow genetic research, identify species, and pr produce identification guides. So if we take the number of authors, say, per decade or per year or per five-year periods, and the number of species in the same time period, and we divide one by the other, bit like a catch per unit effort when people are fishing. It's interesting that we see a decline in the relative number of species per authors over time for both marine species and terrestrial species. And if we look at the numbers of existing species proposed in the literature, we see this large range here from about 0.3 of a million to over 10 million. But these very high ones are all by ratios. So this assumes that this ratio applies globally. And in the middle, this paper by Appleton et al., which is by over 100 editors of the World Register Mean Species, they use three different methods. And this sits right in the middle of the, all the other estimates. So this paper um, in current biology used three methods. The a very empirical one is the percentage of un named species discovered in field work and field samples. And this, on average, found about one third. But one might say that most studies don't find any undescribed species, so this may be an overestimate. There was a statistical model applied, and they also used expert opinion, which is much more wide-ranging, as we might expect. But expert opinions actually agreed with these other estimates in most of the cases. Here are some examples which were we published in a later paper on current biology. And the red dots are the expert opinions. The yellow dots are the model, statistical model predicted. The blue squares are the named species. And you can see from most of the phyla here, they're, they're actually quite closely related. And the two that were outliers up at the top here, the chromista and the nematodes, a year later, the same authors um, and a different group of authors for nematodes uh, revised their estimates downwards. So actually, there's reasonable agreement between statistical extrapolation, um, expert opinion, and how many species are described. And this suggests that we know about two thirds of all species. But this is about 10 years ago we did this analysis and what's been happening since. So there's been a number of other studies on particular taxa, on marine, freshwater, and terrestrial, everything from protozoans to um, fish and plants. And you can see examples down here, they range from, some suggest we know 79% of some of those taxa and some around half, the lowest estimates so that we know half. So one really wonders how people can be saying in the literature that we only know 1% or 10% of all species when there's actually no studies uh, on particular taxa that come up with such low estimates. Um, we can look at these estimates as bar graphs here, and you can see that the lowest is for, um, I think, protozoans up there is around half. And most of these estimates of different groups are for well over half. And we could even look at more detail, and we could look at those estimates over time. We don't see any trend in time because this has been the case for a decade or two. So we already know most species. And 
if we look at the number of species described per year with the number named, these are highly correlated, again suggesting we have a reasonable sample of all species on Earth. And even if we leave out the insects and the plants, which are the two most species-rich groups, we still have a very high correlation. What about those millions of microscopic species? Well, actually, microscopic species are not that rich in number, and there's a good theoretical reason for this, which uh, is around since, uh, again, over 100 years, uh, but has kind of been bypassed by some uh, authors. Um, if we look at the numbers of species and we just divide them into rough groups by phylum as to less than one millimeter, greater than a millimeter, and greater than 10 centimeters, as you expect, the vertebrates and large organisms are relatively few in number. Um, but most organisms are in this macro size here. You can see them with your eyes. They're insects, crustaceans, mollusks, other arthropods. And there's relatively few microscopic ones. So is that because there's a huge number of microscopic species yet to be described, as some have suggested? But ultimately, remember, they, the body size has to come to zero. So at some point, this has to be a dome-shaped curve. It can't be a, a straight line graph from macro-sized to micro-sized. And one of the reasons for this is that microscopic plankton and these megafauna are very, very large, are very, very cosmopolitan, sorry. Um, so in the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, for, for example, the most widespread species are the microscopic plankton, plankton and the megafauna, the fish, birds, mammals, and turtles. And if we look at all marine species here in the, the pale blue graphs, and that's the previous graph in the top right, um, we again see that in the marine environment, we have a higher proportion in the terrestrial of microscopic taxa, which is because of the marine plankton. Um, but we still have this uh, curve with most species in the macro size. And people have also said parasites, that if every species has got a parasite, then half of all species were parasites. And the fact that depending on what you actually count as a parasite, perhaps only 5 to 15% of named species are parasites at the moment, would suggest that there's a huge number of parasites waiting to be described. But if we look at how many parasites are described, these are the trends for the biting flies up above and the fleas. Um, uh, sorry, fleas and, and others. These are terrestrial groups here. And this is the number of species described per year. You can see these have all been decreasing for decades. And I've contacted the experts responsible for maintaining these world's lists, and they agree that it's actually getting rarer and rarer for them to find new species now. So actually, we know most terrestrial parasites, and they make up most parasites on Earth. What about marine ones? Well, marine ones, we've got three groups here, the helminth worms, which are often, um, some of them are internal in the, in the gut passages of the animals. And we have crustaceans and mollusks. And again, we see decreases in the number of parasitic mollusks, but increases in helminth worms and decreases in crustaceans. So in fact, parasites appear to be one of the better known groups of all. And then when we reflect on this, we realize, well, they're pretty important in agriculture, human health, and aquaculture. So they tend to be dis discovered quite quickly because of their pathogenic and often harmful effects on their hosts. Um, on the other hand, if we look at the number of authors, the number of authors has been decreasing in the crustaceans and mollusks as well because the number of species been described has been decreasing. Um, but it's been maintained in the helminth worms. So we have an increasing number of species of helminths with a similar number of authors over time. So it turns out that parasites are not at all host, as host specific as one to one. And this makes good evolutionary sense because if you're, all your eggs are in one basket, as they say, um, it wouldn't be a very good evolutionary strategy. So most parasites will have multiple hosts, and we only notice them on the hosts that they'd happen to be most abundant on in that place and time. Um, there's another great area of confusion, and this goes back to those papers which said there's trillions and billions of species on Earth. Um, and that's the relationship of genetic and species diversity. And I should also mention here the Bass-Becking or Beergenics hypothesis. And this does seem to apply for the microbia, where everything is everywhere and the environment selects where they are. So many protozoans, nematodes, 
um, certainly bacteria, uh, many microalgae, can survive for decades, hundreds of years, and hundreds of years um, until environmental conditions are suitable, and then they can start growing again. And also because they're very small, they're not predated when they're being dispersed. So they can be predated attached to animals in the air, um, in the water, and even through the guts of animals in some cases. So they're highly dispersed, hugely abundant when they're growing, and have a low extinction rate. This means they have very high gene flow. So a lot of these, that's why a lot of these microbes don't have that many species. But they do have huge genetic diversity. And when you look across the major domains of life, we do see, of course, that viruses have the highest genetic diversity, then bacteria, then protozoans, and then the multicellular plants. But species richness is in the opposite direction. So there's really not necessarily any even theoretical reason why genetic diversity should be highly correlated with species diversity. Let's look at the patterns globally in the ocean in terms of species richness. There's two ways of looking at this. One is to use model species ranges, which give us the illusion of great accuracy, and the other is to use um, standardized uh, estimates, empirical estimates of species richness, which have been standardized for sampling effort. But in both cases, we see that most species occur around the coastal tropical areas, the red areas on the lower graph and the dark red on the upper one. And if we look at depth in the ocean, um, we can see, of course, the number of samples decreases rapidly with depth, the top left graph. The next graph below that is the total number of species with depth, and you'd expect that to decrease as sampling effort decreases as well. And if we look at the mean number of species, that also decreases. This is the mean plus minus standard 95% confidence limits. But we can also use the ES50, the estimated number of species in randomly taking, taken samples. And this also rapidly decreases with depth. And whichever metrics we use of species richness or diversity, they decrease with depth on average in the oceans. There are local situations, of course, where this is not the case. You get more variable gradients such as due to low oxygen zones and, and low depths or other uh, topographical features which might change biodiversity. And there's been a lot of exciting discoveries in the ocean, deep sea, and in fact, we're still discovering fascinating animals in the deep sea. Um, but remember that rare habitats like hydrothermal vents are, are temporary habitats, so the species occupying these habitats must have very good dispersal enabled so they can survive by colonizing another habitat when it becomes available. And these go across the major groups of life of uh, octopus, snails, various crustaceans and polychaete worms. And the reason we get less species though in the deep sea is because as we go deeper in the deep sea, the ranges of species change. So on this graph here for sea pens, <clears throat> um, if you count it across the top of the graph, each of these bars is a different genus of sea pens, and we see the same pattern in, in all taxa. Um, you would get most species in shallow water, and as you go down, you also notice that the species that live in deeper water have a much wider depth range. And this is because, as I'll show in the next slide, as we go down in the ocean, we see the environment becomes more similar. In other words, the habitat becomes bigger. Um, there's been a three-dimensional mapping of the ocean by Roger Sayer and uh, another group of authors, um, where they use a number of environmental variables in a data-driven three-dimensional classification. Now, if we do a cross slice through the ocean, and we show here the 200, 800, and 5,000 meter de depths, um, there's a whole lot of species in the little top corner here in these ecological mean units, which are too small to actually see. Um, but you can see that the size of the ecological mean units gets larger with depth and they also become fewer. And the species follow these patterns as well. So the species find greater depth, depth ranges, but also greater spatial ranges in the deep sea. So 
What I've been outlining really is how biogeography informs us about species richness and understanding the biogeography and how species are not evenly distributed across the, the oceans or the planet uh, helps us understand how many species might exist. <clears throat> So to summarize, only about 15% of all species are marine, maybe about 10% are microscopic and 15% parasites, and most marine species are in the coastal tropics. So there's probably around two to three million species of which about at least two million have been named, um, but some of those names with two million in the catalog of life will decrease with tidying up of synonymies, but also will increase as the catalogue of life becomes a little bit more complete. So there are still, for sure, hundreds of thousands of more species to be discovered, um, and but not millions. So as I say to my students, once upon a time, I was told and believed that most species were microscopic, marine, and in the deep sea the taxonomic effort was decreasing and that marine species richness peaks at the equator. So now from our recent research, we show that these things that I was told in university aren't true. So it makes you wonder what we think is true now and what we'll find out or some of the younger people in the audience here today may find out are not true as well. So what about marine species richness peaking at the equator? Um, this is long recognized as the latitudinal diversity gradient that most species occur in the tropics and fewer in the polar regions. And it, the latitudinal gradient sort of integrates a few key variables like temperature and light uh, over latitude across longitudes. But most of the studies that have looked at this have often not even been had the full span of latitudes. They've often been regional on particular taxa. And of course, we know that some taxa are only polar, such as penguins. Um, so depending which taxa one chooses, one may not get the true latitudinal gradient across all species. And to do that, one needs a representative sample of species. And from my previous slides, I argue that we do have a representative sample of marine species uh, and terrestrial species, actually, but for marine species, because we know at least two thirds of them already. So Hania Sa Saidi did her PhD with me a few years back. And during that, she discovered that for razor clams, her group of interest, that, and this is latitude along the bottom here, going from the north to the south, um, and number of species, that there's actually a decrease in species richness at the equator. And first, we thought this is um, probably, you know, an, art, an aberrance of this group, or was a mistake due to undersampling. But actually, she went to all the mu many museums around the world and checked their specimens, and as she cleaned up the data, she found that this dip became even stronger. There's relatively few species around the equator, and most species are in mid-latitude. So perhaps this is a case just for razor clams. Well, we were trying to get this published, and the journal really liked the paper, and they said, everything is fine, but you can't say that this graph is bimodal. And we were kind of, what? That's the most exciting thing about this graph. It's bimodal. Why is it bimodal when we're supposed to have peak richness at the equator? Um, so we went back and dug out all the papers that uh, Hania had been reviewing, and um, we stacked them up in a pile and went through every one. Um, and we also went through OBUS and looked at the data there uh, across all kinds of OBUS contains thousands of different data sets of species collected in different ways of all kinds of species. Um, and this is what we found. We found actually in the literature that pretty much every study had a dip at the equator, but they either just ignored it, and only one of about 60 studies even commented on the dip. They all just assumed it was some um, accident or weakness of their sampling around the equator. But one might argue why the equator in particular, why not plus or minus 10 degrees or a little bit further south or here or there, could easily be as equally be undersampled. Well, in the OBUS database, we can look at sampling effort. The top graph looks at the average number of species per latitude, which of course is highly biased by sampling effort. We see a peak in the northern hemisphere here on the right. In the middle graph, we have the total number of species per latitude. So this kind of averages out because eventually the number of species must reach an asymptote. 
and we see a clear dip around the equator. Um, and if we use the estimated species um, in randomly repeatedly taken samples, um, we end up with a, a clear dip at the equator as well. So this was quite intriguing, but certainly suggested that Hania's earlier data on the razor clams was not unique or unusual, but is in fact typical of many marine taxa. So um, Chaya went on to do her PhD in this topic, having we, we got so excited about bimodality. Um, and we went to see if the bimodal pattern has changed over time. And indeed, she found it did. So this um, graph shows before and after 1985. After 1985 is when the ocean warming was much more consistent uh, spatially and temporally. So we see here that the, the red is before and the blue is after. So you can see the blue is higher than the red lines here with latitude. We see the dip at the equator. So this dip is actually happening and it's deepening because species are shifting away from the equator into mid latitudes, as has been predicted by numerous models by William Chung and other authors in the past. And this is also the case, not just for all species, and it's also a shift of species in the northern hemisphere, as also predicted by models, um, but it's this case for benthic species and pelagic species even more so show much stronger response. Um, so this is very consistent with what we expected from anthropogenic climate change. And in fact, in the paper, we show three time periods back from the 1950s. So this has been happening for over 50 years, even before anthropogenic climate change was really recognized as, as a phenomenon it is today. We've recently looked at this phenomenon in the Arctic, and the Arctic is the area which has been warming four times faster than the rest of the planet, uh, both in land and air, as well as in the ocean. And our study area was from north, the North Sea across the coast of Norway into the Arctic around Svalbard and the Barents Sea in this region here. And we used National Research Troll Survey data, so this is reasonably standardized with about 189 uh, fish species from the 1980s to the 2020. And what we found was that in this northern region of the study area in the Arctic, there's two times more species there now than there were in the 1980s. That's a doubling of fish species. So when we see species richness increases like that, we tend to be pretty happy because we're not happy when we see a decrease in species richness. So it begs the question as to is climate change really a problem for the Arctic? Or what is exactly the problem when you get increasing species richness? And on the left graph here, we show species richness over time. And this is the sea bottom temperature. And the, the similarity is, is amazing, really, because it shows that species are responding within a year to these changes. So the species are already quite dynamic, and the ocean is very well connected in terms of species dispersal, which also means we don't really need to worry about where we put marine protected areas, um, because the species will be moving in and out and through them. Um, what we need is a good marine protected area network that's representative of the physical heterogeneity in the ocean and habitats, and then the species will be able to adapt accordingly. So some Arctic species are decreasing, some are increasing in occurrence. And if we compare the Barents Sea, Svalbard and the North Seas, we can see that actually, interestingly, many Arctic species in Barents and Svalbard are increasing in abundance. And the reason the reason for this increase in Arctic, some Arctic species abundance is because like the Greenland halibut here, a little bit of warming increases their growth rates and body sizes. Whereas the more general rule in fish and many invertebrates is that warmer temperatures mean a smaller body size due to oxygen constraints in relation to their body volume. We can also go back in time and sediment cores of planktonic foraminifera give us a great way to do this because the core can be aged with depth, roughly, not very precisely, but over centuries and thousands and tens of thousands of years. So in this uh, paper led by Yasuhara, 
um, we were able to show that around the last glacial maximum, this is the latitudinal gradient on the right, was more or less flat in the tropics. It's deepened in the, re in the recent pre-industrial centuries. So this is a response due to the warming since the ice age and it's predicted to deepen further in the future because of the known temperature relationships of these species. And if we plot the number of species at the last glacial maximum to recent centuries, and these are different samples because these are different uh, specimens from cores at different depths, um, we can see that this decrease um, is around 20 degrees centigrade that we start seeing as fall in richness. But that could be just um, another unusual feature of planktonic foraminifera. And it's their shells are in the sediment course, of course. No, these are they, when they're alive, they're in the plankton. Um, so we went back and looked at the OBUS data. And here we find an interesting phenomenon around 20 degrees as well. So overall, the data is, reaches an asymptote at about 20 degrees. But if we look at pelagic fish, they decrease after 20 degrees. Benthic invertebrates do as well, and right across different groups of mollusks, polychaetes, and gastropods, and bivalves. Um, but benthic fish seem to increase in, until around 25, 26 degrees. So this is kind of interesting over a database of 50,000 species. And here we break those down into the other subgroups and the pattern is repeated. The red dots here are the Southern Hemisphere and the black dots the Northern Hemisphere. So we do see some groups like the benthic arthropods and polychaetes that there's slight differences in richness in each hemisphere. But in bivalves and gastropods and fishes, that's not so much the case. They're more or less symmetrical in each hemisphere. But an independent data set using standardized scuba surveys of shallow reefs, both rocky reefs and coral reefs, um, divided the assemblages of fish and invertebrates according to their temperature preferences. So there we have temperate and tropical fish and invertebrate communities on the left and right graphs here. And here we see again, um, as same as in the previous data set, that the fish species seem to peak at around 25, 26 degrees, whereas the invertebrates peak around 21 degrees and then decrease thereafter. So it's where these two communities overlap that we see the highest species richness. So we now know that species richness has been declining at the equator since the last glacial maximum. And other data suggest that this has been the case in the fossil record always. So this is not a recent evolutionary feature, but it's a fundamental feature of life on Earth. Um, species generally don't like living at an annual average above 20 degrees centigrade. The exact mechanism we don't know is that the minimum or the maximum or some exposure they have at a temporary time during the year. Um, we know that thousands of species have now been moving into higher latitudes since the 1950s in the ocean. So species are adapting very well um, to climate change and richness is increasing in mid and high latitudes, but it, will de it is decreasing at the equator. So certainly um, fisheries and natural resources around the equator uh, will be losing species and losing abundance probably of other species as well in many areas. But otherwise, we, we can now predict that anywhere that's already at 20 degrees and will be warming will lose species but areas that are on average less than 20 degrees will probably see an increase in species richness in the coming decades if not already so let's look a bit further into this 20 degrees phenomenon there's a well-known graph that uh, you'll have seen in laboratories and from all types of performance curves of species and you can plot any of these curves from growth rate to uh, species richness as I have already um, against temperature and typically the peak of this curve is called the optimum but actually this might be the optimum for performance of that particular trait when it's growing fastest but is it the optimal for evolutionary fitness because if you're growing at your what is called the optimum here and the temperature increases a little you could be dead whereas if the temperature decreases into cooler conditions, well, you'll be alive. And that's why this curve here is asymmetric, which much slower growth rates or performance curves below this optimum and more rapid declines above it. 
So an evolutionary optimum should actually be below this, what's called the optimum here, the maximum performance. Um, and that's what I'm explaining in this second slide here. So we could also look at enzyme stability, which has been looked at in several papers by Ross Corkery and his colleagues. And they find that the maximum enzyme stability is not near the what has been conventionally called T optimum up here, because at this point, uh, the enzyme may become unstable due to the temperature getting too warm or other, um, it, the, the animals may be exposed to other stresses at that temperature. So the real evolutionary optimum is actually below that and is where enzymes would be most stable. So this is the optimal Darwinian fitness. Now, an interesting study uh, about in 2011 by Del et al. Um, they found in a review of 1,000 species that 19 and 21 degrees were the optimum for the growth of marine and freshwater species. So this is kind of interesting because it, it brackets very nicely what we noticed at 20 degrees. So we looked a little bit further into this. And indeed, in the Corkery model papers, where they looked at this uh, thermal stability range across all domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes, they found that they all have the most stable uh, thermal function at 20 degrees centigrade. So this is kind of amazing. And, and we had a, a workshop where we invited Ross Corkery and, and he was equally uh, stunned to see our data on species richness, which also showed this 20 degrees centigrade effect. Um, and we think the reason for this is that if it's the most stable, then tropical and temperate species, as we've already seen, their ranges overlap at around 20 degrees centigrade. So all species, almost, most species can grow at 20 degrees centigrade, one might hypothesize. Well, we looked at that as well. We did a systematic review, and this is what we found. So we had seven, over 7,000 samples. And indeed, um, the graph here is the number of species, and you can see it peaks at just around 20 degrees centigrade. One may find it's 21 or 22 in the future, so let's not be too strict about the 20 degrees centigrade effect, but it's certainly around there. And also we know that this is annual average. But for all these groups of animals, plants, freshwater, marine, terrestrial, and all data, we see that the thermal ranges of species, the maximum in which they occur, all overlap 20 degrees. So what's been happening is that species evolve maybe at 20 degrees, life began at 20 degrees, perhaps, and then species evolved to, to live in colder and warmer temperatures to be able to compete more successfully at those temperatures. So speciation drives species to have different thermal optima to compete more effectively, but fewer species do that. So we end up with most, the species that live at 20 degrees will specialize that and be stenothermal around 20 degrees. And species that live above and below 20 degrees will be more urethermal and have a wider thermal range. Um, and as we start looking through the literature, we see all sorts of other examples of how the 20 degrees effect. Here's just four. The one that the top left is uh, gross phytoplankton production. And this is because above 20 degrees, respiration starts to exceed phyto photosynthesis in most uh, algae, um, including phytoplankton and seabed growing algae, macroalgae. On the right, we see tolerance to oxygen as the lethal concentration to 50% of the animals in a sample. And we see that around 20 degrees centigrade, we suddenly get a lot more sensitivity to oxygen above that temperature. So tolerance to oxygen is not a linear fit as has often been plotted on graphs, but is a curve which increases above 20 degrees. Predation intensity was recently um, studied in a global study using uh, squid pops. These are little samples attached to a stick and they're stuck on the ground around the world. And you look at how fast they're eaten by predators. And peak predation is, wait for it, 20 degrees centigrade. And if we look at net seaweed production, as, as I mentioned before, in relation to phytoplankton productivity, that also peaks at 20 degrees centigrade. So indeed, there seems to be, life seems to be centered around 20 degrees centigrade. So it's the most stable and efficient temperature, and 
if you know the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, um, on the way the Goldilocks zone uh, has been discussed in astronomy, but 20 degrees centigrade, at least on Earth, seems to be the Goldilocks zone for life. So fewer living species have evolved to live above it and, and below it. So to summarize, we now, oh, I already showed you that gross slide, sorry, thank you. So let's conclude with a couple of points then about um, so what. Um, I had a, a supervisor one time and it, it was a bit deflating, but every time I thought I'd discovered something fantastic, he would say, that's very interesting, but so what? So we always, I think it's a good question because it means we think of what, what does it mean, the results we have, and then what comes next and, and opens new avenues for research? Well, we know that about 2 million species are named because they're listed in the catalogue of life, which is freely available in, online. We know that uh, about 150,000 to 160,000 species have been assessed by the IUCN Red List. Uh, this doesn't mean they're all threatened because, in fact, uh, Many of them are not threatened. They're either data deficient or uh, not of concern. We know that about 1,000, almost 1,000 species have gone extinct. They're documented of which 18 are marine. So not many marine species have gone extinct, thankfully. Um, and these extinctions have been caused by the continued deliberate killing introduced predators and islands and habitat loss. And this is still continuing. So, you might think that climate change is causing a lot of species extinctions because many, many papers refer to the extinctions due to climate change. Um, and papers, including some of my own, um, we assess extinction risk due to climate change. But a risk can increase, but it doesn't really tell us so much about what will actually happen, how many will go extinct. It tells you the direction of the risk. And of course, the risk due to climate change will increase because of all the varying effects of climate change and extreme weather events, uh, which are combined with all the other factors already causing species extinctions. But uh, if I perhaps ask the audience here how many species think have gone to climate change, you start looking. In fact, there's only two. Um, and these are even debated. One is a frog on a mountain top where they think drought and dry conditions led to its uh, extinction. And the other was a, a marsupial mouse on a, an island off the coast of Australia. And these are actually well documented in Wikipedia, perhaps even better than in the scientific literature. Um, and the marsupial mouse may have probably went extinct due to sea level rise um, combined with uh, ocean weather events. Um, so there's no marine species have yet gone extinct due to climate change. And from what we can see, they can move around pretty well. So most marine species have probably survived warmer conditions uh, during the last climatic optimum some thousands of years ago uh, when the Arctic was ice free as well. Uh, and they have survived those events before. So if we don't keep um, stressing and uh, killing these species um, and pushing them towards extinction with the other things we're doing, um, they would probably survive climate change. There may be some species in the Mediterranean or other enclosed sea seas that uh, may not survive climate change because they're trapped and can't move. But they would, they would be able to be few, but it does give us the opportunity then to look at those species that may be trapped due to climate change and see if we can rescue them in any way or assist their survival. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for your attendance. And I apologize I couldn't be there in person. And uh, I just give a link to my couple of my websites here. Um, another thing I champion are marine reserves. I think they're fantastic. Um, having lived beside one New Zealand and um, the very first one, which is in the 1970s. And when people went there and saw it, they all wanted more. So that they're like chocolates. Once you see one good marine reserve and the abundance of life, uh, people just want more around the country as well. And they've got 44 in New Zealand now. Um, and I wish more countries could have similar fully protected areas. And my Oceans of Biodiversity at Auckland um, at uh, ACNZ website. Thank you very much.
very much, Mark. Uh, thank you for um, recording this video for us. Um, I don't know if there are any questions. So I've, I've just checked the um, chat here. There's no questions in the um, in the chat so far. Just as a reminder for everyone, if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand um, and ask the question in person, or you can pop it in the meeting chat. Um, I, might I think just... there is just one question now. Um... Ah, yeah. I see it now. Mark, uh, I don't know if you're seeing the chat, but the first question will be uh, how to predict whether a species will modify their distribution in latitude, in depth, or will go extinct as a result of climate change? Hello, Anna. Thanks for the good question. Look forward to seeing you, I think, later this year once you start working in Portugal. Um, how to predict? Well, I think uh, temperature is the primary driver um, and we already can check maybe if some species are moving at latitude. And if temperature is warming at deeper depths as well, then it seems logical that the species will move to greater depths. Maybe not in such abundance as in shallow water. Uh, but this depth shift in distribution hasn't really been demonstrated for species yet, probably because we lack uh, observations at depth over depth gradients. Um, so be re I think it'd be quite exciting to see some papers that look at this uh, over depth in time. And maybe there are some places with depth gradient data over time that can check this. Thank you, Mark. Um, any questions in the room? Uh, any other questions in online? There is no other questions online at the moment. Um, actually, I, ha I have one from my side um, in terms of just marine biodiversity monitoring. What's the, what's the biggest challenges um, that you see in the next few years for that, um, maybe in terms of climate change, but also um, just in general, what, what's the upcoming biggest challenges that you need to tackle for marine biodiversity monitoring? I think the first one is getting data published quickly. At the moment, if I'm a, as a citizen scientist, I can use a citizen scientist app and the data goes up online into their database like Guy Naturalist, and they publish it once a month into GBIF. So why can't scientists do the same? Because we've all this baggage of how we work and we've other things to do. So, but there's not much point in waiting five years for our data to be published, after which time things have moved on. So I think that's the first challenge that the existing data that's being monitored and why in MBON Europe, we, we, we have, why in Euromarine we've set up MBON Europe to try and speed up this process with the organizations that are already doing biodiversity monitoring. Now, the second question, of course, is, is there enough biodiversity monitoring? And probably not. So we need more data, deeper water, um, maybe different taxa in different areas. But the first thing is, is to get what we are doing available for people to monitor and just publish it online in GBIF and OBIS and let people uh, analyze it and use it. So they, the, the big mistake many of us make is we get data and then we sit on it for years and years uh, before we publish it. Um, and yet if we had just published the data earlier, other people might have used it and we could have our, our conscience could have been clear that the data was useful to science, even if we didn't publish it ourselves. Ah, uh, brilliant. Yeah, that, that's a very good tip, I suppose, for, for all the researchers out there that are gathering data. Um, thanks for that. And then yeah. also what I, what I found quite interesting during your talk is um, that you say that marine protected areas, because of how um, species move um, and how fast they adapt, it's, there is no point in having marine protected areas by countries, but it needs to be a whole network that works together. So in terms of that, what is your recommendation? Or I suppose it's a big question, but um, what's your recommendation for going about that? Or how could that happen, um, you know, yeah. that, that they work together? It's a good question. I, I know, and when, when they identify areas of importance for birds, they have quantitative data on bird populations. So that's where they select the special areas of conservation for birds in Europe, for example, and other places. They don't say that every country should protect 
five percent of its area for bird species because it's obvious that that wouldn't address the needs of those bird species but we, similarly it's a bit strange that in europe they're asking countries each country to protect 30 percent but uh, i don't want to you know downplay the diversity differences between countries but 30 percent in one country may be very very little diversity and there could be a huge amount in other countries so it, sh it should really be done at a, a european at least european if not global scale and um, so you have a, a network because many of the features of habitats will not change during climate change or significantly. So the, the slope, the depth, the uh, topographic variation, a lot of these basic oceanographic features will remain the same. So probably, I think areas that have high, this is only a hypothesis, which somebody should test, maybe me, I don't know. Um, places already with high diversity will probably have high diversity in the future, even if the species composition is different. But that's uh, something that remains to be tested, which because the species are moving. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks so much for that. Um, any I other have questions? another question just uh, related to what you just um, were asking. You know, Mark, now the EU Commission has set up the Mission Ocean, Restore Our Oceans and Water. And yeah. one of the targets is to uh, strictly protect. Uh, 30% of all the marine areas in the three, um, in the four basins, and also including uh, fresh water. Um, and there are uh, some funding available to do that, but uh, how do you think we can do that? Do you think that's, how, how can that happen? Um, well, that's, I guess, a social political question, isn't it? Rather than, um... Because we can identify and what NPA Europe project is, will do is identify at a European scale the ideal places for a network. And I think it's good that they separate the ocean basins because we already know that there's very big differences in species composition between the Atlantic and Mediterranean and Black Sea. So that's a good starting point. Um, but then I think uh, politicians need to work with the voters and the, the citizens to because most people realize this is a good idea. It's like having a new hospital or a new um, school or a museum or a sports field. All these are public goods. And these marine reserves and protected areas are public goods as well on public land because the ocean belongs to the public. Um, and I hope the politicians can avoid being sidetracked by big industry or vested interests who want to just profit from some aspect of, of the resources temporarily and uh, create marine protected areas. I, I, I'm not sure if 30% is the right target myself. I, I would be happier to see every country with at least one fully protected area that's really well protected. And then people can see how good it is. This is how it started in New Zealand. And maybe some fully protected areas where there's good public access, maybe some other ones that are representative and just a few, and then build on from these fully protected ones. Because this approach that they're doing in many countries, most countries, with these partly protected ones, they don't, they're neither one thing nor the other. They're, they're really a, well, not quite a waste of time, but they really don't protect biodiversity and you don't see the benefits. So, uh, yeah, I think if politicians just uh, started small, like uh, uh, Bill Ballantyne and I used to joke that the first one was like a box of chocolates. And suddenly somebody got some chocolates and they said, oh, I've never had them before. We want more. So um, once you once the people see the benefits from some and they see there's really no harm, it doesn't, there's no decline in fisheries. There may even be an increase in fisheries stability because of it. Um, and uh, then people will want them and they will expand. But most of Europe, especially Northern Europe, hasn't even really had this conversation properly yet. I think Southern Europe is ahead of Northern Europe in this area. Thank you. And um, I have just another quick question related to monitoring. So you said that we should, all uh, scientists should uh, share the data, but do you think there is a need for a standardization on how the data are collected and how they should be used? Because it can be very big difference between methodologies of collecting data. On biodiversity we should we should work towards that but just knowing the presence of a species in one place and time is a, is very useful that's the that's the basic thing so if that's the case it doesn't really matter too much how they're collected 
And I don't use the word data sharing. I use the word data publishing because scientists are paid to publish. That's how our careers develop. Whereas sharing is a more ambiguous uh, term and suggests licensing. So that's why nobody really shares data. Some, many people publish it. And there you, you had two parts. One was the need for standardization of sampling. I think we should work towards that. And then on Europe, that's one of the three things that they plan to do, to keep the monitoring going, to publish the data and work towards standardization. But we shouldn't uh, get distracted by the standardization. We should get do the monitoring and publish quickly. Was there another question you had and I've forgotten it? Sorry? Did you have a second question? Oh, no, that was it. Uh, that was my question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if there are no other questions uh, in the room or in the chat, uh, we would like to thank you very much for your time, Mark. It was great to have you here. Uh, thank you for recording the video. It was great and the quality was perfect. So, we really enjoy uh, having you both in person 